everyone. It is Tuesday, so that means it's time to come on live and talk about a topic that was brought up in the group, which I'm like super, I have a lot to say about this topic. I love when people in the group bring just like issues up and like are honest about like what they're struggling with in their, um, in their classrooms or in their schools because that's what this group is about. It's about, you know, collaborating and getting support and really uh, feeling like you have a community of people that you can talk to. And um, we have 1,371 members in this group now, which is so exciting. And um, yeah, I think that's, that's really, really neat. And you all join this group and, you know, the group is called Workshop Inspiration for upper grades and so we're all upper grade teachers whether you're like fifth grade maybe even fourth grade teachers in here all the way up to like seniors you know uh, maybe even there's teachers in here who teach like college I don't know you'd have to you know comment more and interact more for me to really find out like more about you and the members in this group um, so if this is the first live you've ever watched um, by me, I'm Amanda. Uh, I teach eighth grade English in the Bay Area, and I also teach drama. Uh, this is my 13th year teaching, and what else? I have a website. It's uh, amandarightnow.com, and if you are here in the comments, I see there's people here. Uh, tell about yourself in the comments. Introduce yourself. What grade do you teach? Where are you in the world? Um, and how long have you been teaching? Let's get to know each other. So um, this whole idea of sticking to a program, like, wow, and sticking to a script. So I, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. I am a very like enthusiastic and maybe you all have seen me in my videos before like I get really really excited and revved up and I'm like super energetic and I'm like running around my classroom and I just get really excited like I'm very easily excitable and my husband you know he actually kind of like I'll tell him about a book that I'm reading and I'm just like obsessed with it and I'm oh my gosh this is the best thing in the world and I can't wait you know to apply this to my life and I get like really excited about programs right like and change and becoming a better person and like I'll read a self-help book and I'll like think this is the the bible and I, I I just need to like live my life like this from now on and my husband like he calls me on it he's like Amanda you know you know you do this you have this pattern of like getting obsessed with like a program and like following it you know, to a T with fidelity. And I'm here to tell you right now that it's not healthy. Like it is not good to follow any program to fidelity for years and years and years and years and years because it stunts your growth. Um, and so I actually want to talk about I have a five-year-old daughter and I'll, I'll bring this back to like being a teacher and bring, being like teaching writing and, and how we can, um, be like, well, okay. So sometimes it is important to, to follow a program for a short while. And I noticed that some people in the comments, they talked about like when you're begin a beginner, it's good to have a script, right? So like, it's good to have something, like something to help you through, you know? And so in that way, a program, that's what the purpose of a program is. A purpose of a program is to introduce you to this new way of teaching or this new, you know, it's, it's to help you grow, right? As a teacher or person, whether you're following a self-help book or you're following a diet or you're following um, cr uh, curriculum, like a teacher's guide, right? Like that's the purpose of a program is to help you learn about the program and learn a new way of thinking. Um, and so, but at some point, I'm learning this, right? I'm learning, and we're all learning this. Like at some point you have to deviate from the program. You have to pick what works for you and take it and run with it. Like what is it about that program that resonated with you and keep it? And the rest, can you can leave it, right? So let me talk about my daughter. So my daughter is five. She's in kindergarten now. She just started kindergarten. And um, I have been struggling. Like I'm a mom and I work full time. My husband works full time. 
and it's hard. You know, it's like we all, I think we're, many of us are moms and we re, like, it's just like impossible. <laughs> like, I feel like sometimes I'm just like, I don't know what to do about you. And so I've read all of these books, these parenting books, right? And I read this book called Listen, Five Simple Tools to Meet Your Everyday Parenting Challenges. And I was obsessed. I love it. I love it. It's beautiful. It's a beautifully written book. And the philosophy is just so sweet and caring. And I don't know if any of you have ever heard of Rye Parenting. Um, but it's very much like like that, like aligned with that. So she t the five simple tools are... Um, are special time so like making sure that you spend you know at least five to ten minutes of timed time with your child where they are your number one focus and attention and they get to control what you do so like they get to be the leader and they get to and it's basically like giving them time to be heard giving them time to like tell you what to do because they're spending all day long listening to adults tell them what to do. And so that's one of the things that I really latched onto with this program was this special time idea. And that if you spend like time connecting with your child, and I feel like this applies to the classroom too, um, that they are more willing and more, they're more, they're, they really want to listen. Like they actually they're like, wow, my mommy's listening to me or my teacher's listening to me. Like they want to please. And I really get that. Like that resonates with me. And there's other, there's five simple tools. And what, another one is setting limits. Um, and so it's not all like nicey, nice, let my kid boss me around. Uh, <laughs> and there's, there's this thing called, um, what is it called? Stay listening, where you kind of let your kid throw a fit and let them cry as much as they want because they need to get that emotion out and telling them to stop crying and like, you know, go to your room and like, you know, punishing them for crying is actually kind of detrimental um, to your child. And so these are all just philosophies from this book. Okay. And I was like, oh my gosh, I have to like, I have to do everything this book tells me to do and I have to follow it to a T. And my husband was like watching me with this. He was like, okay, Amanda, okay. You're getting kind of obsessed with this like program. So then she starts kindergarten and her teacher tells us that she is out of control, that she cannot control herself, that she thinks she runs the classroom. And I'm just like, oh my God, what am I doing? I don't know what I'm doing. Like someone help me be a parent. And so this, the, the, her kindergarten teacher recommended this other program um, or book and this other book is called one two three magic I don't know if any of you have ever heard of it but it is very much magic um, and if you've never read it and you're a parent and you're struggling with your kid listening to you like you should read it uh, and I, I love this book like I love this book just as much as I love listen but it's like two different philosophies so one two three magic is all about like um, you know, setting very clear limits and like the two biggest parenting mistakes that people make are talking too much because it allows for arguing and being too emotional. And I am guilty of both of those things in my classroom and as a parent and that you really need to set limits and you need to say, you know what, you're doing this. So as soon as you see them like doing some sort of obnoxious behavior is what the author calls it. Like parents have three jobs stop obnoxious behavior spend quality time with your kid and then what's the other there's some other job I can't remember obnoxious behavior stop obnoxious behavior spend quality time and teach kids um, your child and your students start behavior like behavior that's gonna help them in life like brushing your teeth eating healthy food, things like that. So start behavior, stop behavior, and building relationships. But what this book really showed me was that the other book didn't show me was like, I need to be very clear about my limits with my daughter. And I need to, you know, not talk, not be emotional. When she's whining, I go, that's one. And I don't do it in an emotional way at all. And then if she keeps doing it, I say, that's two. And I have not gone, well, actually, this is not true. So the last week, I have not gotten past two. She stopped. And it's like, what? This is magic. And then when you get to three, you say, take five. And so, and this is a program. Like, just like Lucy Calkins is a kind of a program, um, 
this stuff is a program. Like there's all these programs, right? Like diets are programs. And so when you get to three, it's take five. And so that means five minutes of you need to, you know, it, it's kind of timeout, which I hate timeout, but, but if it, it, and if it's possible, it could be some other consequence that relates to what they're doing. So like if you're at a park and they're doing something, the consequence could be we're leaving the park. So as often as possible, the consequence should fit whatever they were doing. But if it doesn't, like if they're just whining, then they need time, five minutes to breathe or something in a special place. Um, and so anyways, what I'm trying to get at here is that, but this, this philosophy is very much like hardcore, clear cut, like you need limits and you need, I mean, it's a, it's that talks about timeout and taking toys and things like that, which the other program doesn't really, that program, the listen program, listen by Patty Whip, Whipfler and um, Tasha Score doesn't really include that. Okay. And so I, this is kind of an analogy for our teaching lives, right? Like workshop. Do I do workshop every single day of my teaching life? No way. <laughs> no way. What I love about workshop is the structure. Do I, do I follow Lucy Calkins to a T? I used to when I first started and I would like actually read some of the sentences that are in the units of study book, like, like word for word. I don't do it anymore because I feel comfortable with the structure. Um, and I actually just did a PD um, yesterday for my district and I talked about all the structures of workshop and I keep going back here because there's a poster that I'm gonna show you in a minute. Um, but like project-based learning, that we need to be doing that stuff in our classrooms inquiry-based learning, um, reading really advanced literature and having discussions with our students, just spending a period having like deep, meaningful discussions. Yes, do all of that, like keep doing that. Like I don't, I think, you know, when we think workshop, for some reason it's associated with Lucy Calkins and units of study, which I love the units of study, but I don't think we should be associating workshop with just Lucy Calkins. What I associate workshop with is students writing for meaningful purposes and students building their confidence and their habits as readers and writers. That's what workshop means to me. What does workshop mean to you? Okay, I'm like getting goosebumps talking about this stuff. Like I feel really passionate about how we need to pick and choose the parts of the program that work for us, right? Like, because at the end of the day, like it's all about our relationships with our kids, our relationships with ourselves and like feeling good, right? Like we, life is hard enough. We need to do what feels good to us, right? Okay, I'm gonna go get that poster and show you the structure. Um, I made this and it's so funny and I'll put a picture of this in, um, I'll put a picture of this in uh, the Facebook group. But I made this poster and I showed my students, but this was for the like professional development that I did. And I was like, look, adults make posters too. So it's real world. Like, yes, adults make posters um, for various reasons in their careers. <laughs> like scientists, you know, like poster sessions. So when kids think posters aren't real world or teachers think posters aren't real world, yes, they are. Look, <laughs> I'm 36 years old and I just made this poster the other day. Okay, so let me just show you what the structures of workshop are. And nowhere on here does it talk about Lucy Calkins or the units of study. So what I love about workshop is the structures. So every single part of your day has a structure. And when I do workshop units, I follow these structures. When I do my Shakespeare unit, do I follow these structures? No. I just teach Shakespeare and kids are getting up and they're acting and we're analyzing Shakespeare and we're having fun. Um, we're watching videos like Shakespeare in the park. Like, am I doing workshop? No, I'm not doing <laughs> workshop. So yes, I'm obsessed with workshop, but I do other things in my class too. Um, okay, I'm gonna stop holding this up, but yeah, so these are the structures. So there's a the structure of the class period. There's a the structure for the mini lesson. There's the structure for work time. There's the structure for conferences. There's the structure for closure. So there's like this, just the structure, the outline of how um, these things go is what I've really loved about workshop because 
like the 10 minute mini lesson, that makes planning really easy for me because if I if the lesson's only 10 minutes, then um, then I should only be planning for 10 minutes, right? Um, so yes, this is workshop. And I'm, I'm gonna put the picture in the Facebook group. I've been talking a lot about programs, so I think the takeaway from this video, hopefully you took away that you, yes, when you're a beginner, follow a program, but once you've done it for a little while, you just pick and choose what what's the best part about that program for you and you run with it, right? Like I did Whole30 a few years ago and it was amazing. Like I did Whole30, Whole30 is a month, 30 days of clean eating. You just eat like the most healthy food, nothing processed, no alcohol, no sugar, no flour. It's insane, it's insanity. I did Whole30 and I felt so amazing afterwards. Um, and I haven't done it again since. But you know what? There's certain things about Whole30 that have stuck with me. I took what I what I wanted from that program and I feel like I'm a healthier person because I don't put a bunch of sugar in my coffee. I don't go to Starbucks like ever really to get like, you know, those really sugary drinks. Drinks, I've cut out, like I stopped drinking soda. Like those things are what I took away from, from doing Whole30. So take what you want and run with it. Okay, I hope this video was helpful. Tell me in the comments if it was, um, and I will see you next Tuesday. I did not use my microphone today, darn it, so the sound quality is probably bad, but oh well, hopefully the quality, the content was good. This video, parenting, teaching, eating, all sorts of stuff. <laughs> okay, bye everyone, thanks for watching.